departed to Vidi Ines, but it is unti. Amen. So we have for today uh, Saint Vincent de Paul, um, a French saint from the uh, 16th century, uh, 16th and 17th century. Um, I think we're all familiar with the Saint Vincent de Paul Society, so it's a familiar name. Uh, but I think his story is 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 um, rather unfamiliar, um, especially his earlier years, as we will see. Uh, but he was born in the year 1581, um, and that was have been right around the time of the Council of Trent, and would end up doing most of his work in the 1600s, which is well into the religious wars in Europe. So that clash between uh, that, that that kind of dissolution. Of, of Christendom and uh, you know the, the fights between the Protestants and the Catholics and it was much more um, well of course uh, it was religiously uh, it was about um, not so much about religion as it was about authority and that's what religion is ultimately religious wars is about who's in control God or man that's what all religious wars come down to God's religion or man's religion or some variant of it so that's what the, the Protestant wars were, were and, and, and St. Vincent de Paul would, would uh, 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 end up growing up, uh, being educated in and working in, you know, kind of that, that milieu, right, that, that um, uh, the aftermath and, and, the, and the occurrence of those religious wars. Uh, in any case, he was born to a, a poor, he was a poor farming family, uh, um, but he had a, an intellectual aptitude, and so he was sent for studies in Paris. Um, his father, I think, afforded uh, his education by selling their, their family yoke of oxen uh, to do that, to give him those studies. So quite a, um, you know, quite a sacrifice by his parents. Um, but his character, uh, he was, had an irascible temperament as a young man, um, which is irascible. That's the Latin word for anger. Ira is anger. So an irascible temperament, choleric. Um, and he had a bad attitude. Um, he... Um, uh, was some, he was ashamed of his, of his uh, poor upbringing uh, there amongst the, um, the affluent. And there were so many you know, young men who went to Paris to study from rich families, from noble families, and he was nobody. And so he, he, was, he had very much shame of that, even though his family had sacrificed much to get him there. Uh, he, he, he didn't want to be associated with them. Uh, he had quite a bit of ambition and would spend his time among the affluent. He would, he would spend as much time as he could with those who were wealthy, people who had a lot of titles. So uh, quite a bit of pride and ambition uh, with young uh, St. Vincent here. Um, at the school, there were the, uh, many factions among the students. You can imagine, as I said, the religious wars. There's, there's gonna be some tension there in the students. Uh, there were fights, armed conflicts, and even a, a, a school official was murdered. Uh, so St. Vincent himself wasn't directly involved in all this, but that is the environment that he um, received his education. Uh, very interesting. So he received, uh, he was ordained a priest at 19 years old. Uh, this was contrary to what the Council of Trent had decreed, that, that a man had to be 24 prior to being ordained. But so you can see kind of the... the um, uh, even though decrees had been made and this is the way things were supposed to be, that wasn't the way things were. So he was ordained far too young, far too early, and the first parish he was sent to sent him back. Like the parishioners refused to accept him. This kid is 19 years old. Like, no. So, um, so that was kind of a false start for St. Vincent de Paul. Um, so he returned to the, the, um, um, uh, the, 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 um, was it the, um, uh, um, uh, Paris, the university. He returned to the university, returned to, they didn't even have seminaries yet at this point, right? Uh, uh, Trent established a need for seminaries, and so that was just beginning. Um, so he finished the studies in 1604, so he's 20, I think 25 now, and uh, he went to journey. I think he was on uh, some kind of uh, family business. He ended up being kidnapped by Barbary pirates and uh, was sold and resold as a slave for the next two years. Two, I mean, imagine that. He's ordained a priest. He's been to university. He's gotten his uh, uh, theology, philosophy. He spent all this time among the affluent, all this time, you know, being ashamed of his past. And now what? He gets captured as a slave. Uh, not, not the life event anybody expects to happen, or at least maybe in the 1600s you did, but um, that, that was a definitely a a turn that was not in his plan of life, we would say, being, being captured and sold as a slave. 
Uh, so this, this uh, would leave uh, an impact on him. For two years, um, he is a slave, and then when he is finally uh, released, he finally gets his um, um, freedom again. Uh, that greatly changed him, greatly changed him, as you can imagine. Um, so he, um, uh, he returns to, I think, Paris, or rather Rome. He goes back to Rome, spends some time completing uh, some last studies there, and then he is sent to a small country parish in 1612. Um, he served there less than a year, but, but it um, completed the change that was begun by his enslavement. Uh, because of those religious wars in Europe, he saw abject poverty in the countryside, and he saw people suffering from the effects of that war. People were dying of malnutrition. They lacked the necessities of life. While in the meantime, uh, that rich nobility with whom St. Vincent de Paul loved to associate, they were living in the most luxurious manner. And so he saw this huge, huge dichotomy. People are dying of malnutrition, and meanwhile, the rich people are, uh, you know, they're, they're throwing away food that the, the poor people would love to have. So this is what had happened, and this is in France. So um, this, this greatly affected him, and, and those rich people, they, it wasn't like they were bad people. They were devout, they were pious, they just, they didn't know, and there was no way f to, to get the excess of the rich to, 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 the, uh, to the necessity of the poor. There was no way to do that. So that is what St. Vincent de Paul uh, spent the rest of his life doing, was becoming that vehicle and establishing a way to get uh, um, that excess uh, from the wealthy and the affluent to the poor. So um, he, he began to, to talk and, and, and to uh, uh, go among the, uh, that, that circle of, of the rich, and he created a network. And he founded what he called the Ladies of Charity, and he organized them into groups, and they would go from uh, house to house of, of the other rich and the affluent, and they would request furniture, food, and clothing. And very often, the, the rich, they had so much, they would give things away, they would throw things away that, that the, the poor needed. So he, he organized these groups to, to go and collect these things, and then St. Vincent would distribute it among the poorer families. Um, I think this was the, the, um, was the original Craigslist. So like Vin Vincent's List, maybe, is what, what we could call it. Uh, so, and, and this model, this model of what he did of connecting, making a connection between those, those who had and those who needed uh, was so successful, other parishes sought him out and said, hey, can, can you show us what you're doing so that we can, we can do it in our own parish? And so then it started to happen. And, and so often that's, that's the case. It's not, that, it's not that something can't be accomplished or something can't be done. It's that people don't know how to do it. And especially when you know, all it takes is, is like one good idea and somebody with, with, with the energy to make it happen and you can accomplish so much. So that's what he did. Over the next 15 years, um, this effort would expand to include uh, collecting uh, funds and goods, not just for the poor, but for missionary projects, for founding hospitals, uh, for gathering relief for the victims of war. And also, um, St. Vincent's efforts would end up uh, in the ransom of 1,200 galley slaves from North Africa. I mean, he himself was a slave for two years. He knew what that was like. Um, so the, the, the ladies' groups that he organized would eventually result in uh, the founding of the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul. Um, and let's see, also, let's see, St. Vincent account, encountered tremendous ignorance among the clergy and the priests. And this is not surprising, uh, again, due to war and due to the lack of a, of a consistent seminary education. So um, St. Vincent himself uh, recognized he, had a, he, had, he did not have a very good ecclesiastical education. So he began to preach retreats and missions for other priests. Um, and his efforts <clears throat> were instrumental in eventually, along with those, um, uh, the recognition that of the Council of Trent that seminaries needed to be established and priests needed to have a very good, especially a good doctrinal education, because this, this is why the religious wars were happening, is priests didn't know their theology. Uh, you know, and, the, and, the, and when you have a priest who doesn't know his theology, a priest who doesn't know his catechism, the people don't know their catechism, and that was the problem. So, so he would end up establishing uh, the Vincentians, and the, the, the Vincentian Fathers would, was a society of priests, and they would end up becoming uh, spiritual directors in 53 different seminaries in France, right? uh, imparting that, that good um, and orthodox um, uh, dogma. 
Uh, so St. Vincent de Paul, what he, what he founded the Daughters of Charity and he founded the Vincentians, but he did not found the Society of St. Vincent de Paul that we all know and are familiar with. He didn't found that. That was founded um, in the 1800s by Blessed Frederick uh, Ozanam, who had a devotion to St. Vincent de Paul. That, that's where that society comes from and that it is very popular today right, with good reason. Uh, so St. Vincent would, would spend his, the rest of his life uh, uh, thus, right, giving his life to God, uh, um, uh, helping to redistribute, and this is, this, this is communism, right? This is proper communism, where, where you only ever see communism working in the church, where people who have an excess of it, they give it away by, by charity. They give it away because they want to give it away, and Vin St. Vincent de Paul was helping them to do that, and those poor persons who were in abject poverty, they didn't demand it. They were willing to receive it, and they would only receive as much as they needed, and especially among those poor persons, you know, they, they would share among themselves to those less fortunate. So that, that's always how charity has to work. And it's, it's been said, and I completely agree, that government should not be involved in charity. Because once you get the government, once you get the state involved, it's no longer charity. That is the realm of churches. Churches are in, they're in the business of distributing to the poor and giving out of love. That's how charity has to be done. When you start doing it out of force, when you start taking from people and giving it to others, that, 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 that causes more, uh, more problems than it's worth, and, and you eviscerate, you take the love out of charity. Uh, and so people are not drawn to God. They are not drawn to goodness. They just they come to t think of it as a, a, as a right and a, a, or an obligation of other people. You owe that to me. Why? Because I need it and you don't. Who gets to make that decision? So th this is the proper role of charity. This is how charity should happen. It should be the church and it should be out of love for people. Um, so that's what St. Vincent de Paul would do. And he would, he would um, pass to his eternal reward in the year 1660 at 79 years of age. And what he was able to accomplish what, through his efforts, um, um, uh, the Vincentian Fathers today have 4,000 members worldwide, and the Daughters of Charity have 18,000 members. And his remains, um, his heart has remained incorrupt over the centuries, and um, his remains are kept in Paris, France. In fact, I remember um, a few years ago, I did a pilgrimage, the Chartres Pilgrimage, and when I was there in Paris, I visited uh, the Church of St. Vincent de Paul, and the, there above the altar, you, you see in a glass case, you see uh, the remains of Vincent de Paul himself. So um, once, once more, uh, uh, our legacy, our church, and our example. Um, you don't have to be perfect from the beginning. Remember that early life of St. Vincent, how choleric he was, how proud he was, how um, uh, ambitious he was, and how he loved to spend time among the affluent. Um, well, he learned his lesson, right? He became a slave, and, and if we could say those two years he spent in slavery were probably the best years of his life because that salvaged the whole rest of it. Had he not spent that two years in slavery, had he been able to maybe spend it in the palace of the king, what would have happened to him? What would have happened to his priesthood? Right, so that's what we have to keep in mind. Oftentimes, the hardest things and the worst things that happen to us, if we give it to God, if we really think about what this life is for, um, that can become the best part of our life, uh, that we thought it was the worst, it turns into the, into the best, and it's our attitude that does that. Uh, so let us, uh, like St. Vincent de Paul, uh, always look for that opportunity and, and turn it to good, and who knows what we, we, what we can accomplish uh, for others. Uh, so may God bless you all in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.